Hey, hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? I hope you are good. I'm great. I've been, all right, tripod's already getting twitchy. Sitting out here with some of my plants. I was getting ready to do some watering with my fatsias. I picked up this one not too long ago. It was in one of my plant hauls. This is one it's called Spider's Web or spider web. I don't know if it's possessive or not. Can't remember. There was enough talk about this one in that video that I thought this would be a fun plant to talk about. They're one that I've grown for a really long time and really come to have a lot of appreciation for. I don't really know how popular they are amongst the like plant market, but a fair amount of people seem to be starting to grow these indoors and out. So I know they're gaining some traction and there's a lot to go into when it comes to growing these plants. So they're pretty simple to grow, but there's just a sweet spot. And if you're not in that sweet spot, then, well, then they're not simple to grow. Pardon the lighting. I've been waiting for some clouds. They don't seem to be coming. So it's just gonna be super bright, overexposed plants, I guess. Try and make it work. Anyways, Fetsia japonica. These guys, right here, all three of them. There are several different varieties of cultivars that have different patterns on their leaves. This is the spider's web or spider web. This is just the regular, your typical Fatsia japonica right here. This one over here was sold as a spider web, but I'm pretty sure it's just variegated. We'll talk about why it doesn't look variegated here in a little while. I've also grown the camouflage, which is a really fun one. It's just, it has like different shades of green kind of splashed into the foliage. Turned out to not be quite as cold hardy, hence why it's not sitting here with the others. That could have been for a lot of different reasons. Maybe it's potting mix held too much moisture. I don't really know, but it didn't make it through last winter anywhere near as well as these two did, or at all. It's dead. I tend to push the plants that I know can take cold pretty hard so I can see what their limits are. So I want to talk about growing them both indoors and out. So go over some of the various things that I've noticed, like troubleshooting issues and just what seems to make them thrive and what they don't seem to appreciate. But for starters, we'll talk like exactly what is this plant? Fatsia japonica. These are a lovely evergreen woody perennial. They'll get a trunk on them that'll grow anywhere from six to I believe 16 feet. I'm sure that there's some variation there depending on which cultivar you're growing, but just a regular one, six to 16 feet. That 16 feet is going to be more towards its native area, which I believe is Japan and Korea, where they grow in nice, organically rich, very well-drained, like rocky types of soils, or I should say, what's the word? Sharply drained soils in areas with a decent amount of rainfall. They have these gorgeous palmitate type leaves, heavily lobed, and these will get quite large as well. The leaves on all of mine are smaller, and that's for a few different reasons. Partially because they're potted, so these are a plant where you will usually get larger leaves with the larger pots. I don't have these in very big pots and uh, in the ground, they're going to grow much more quickly as well. Here in the US, the nicest looking ones that I've ever seen have always been up in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, the US is huge. I haven't been everywhere. I'm sure that there are tons of them all over the place that look absolutely beautiful. But it's those ones that I've seen like up in the Seattle, the Puget Sound area that just, oh my gosh, they shine, they're glorious, big, beautiful plants. They're typically regarded as hardy, and I would say that this is pretty conservative, zones eight and up. However, I used to have these growing in the ground here in zone 6B. They would die down to the ground in the winter, so they weren't hardy as far as the growth goes, but they were root hardy, no problem. And they'd come back and get about 18 to 24 inches tall every year. I stopped having success with that when the tree that was growing above them had to go and so they weren't getting enough shade. Saying hardy in zone eight is also saying you can put this in the ground and you don't have to worry about it during the winter. I would say 7B should be fine. Even 7A in a nice sheltered location, probably going to be okay. I leave mine outside, not this one, this one's new, but these two plus the one that died, I have always left those outside into the teens and they're potted. So potted plants are going to be even more susceptible to cold damage. And I think I had these out pretty much all winter with the exception of the, this extreme cold blast that we had this past February that most of the US had. I pulled them in because it was like minus five degrees Fahrenheit outside. That would, that would have totally killed them. So uh, these got temperatures while they were in their pots to around 
I think the coldest they got was about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And they did okay, but they were up against a brick wall on top of pavement in a fairly sheltered location. So it's probably more like 15 degrees. I wouldn't let them sit out if you have them potted below 15 degrees Fahrenheit. I bring them in just to be safe because they don't grow really fast. It's because of that slower growth. Any damage you have, it's going to take a little bit longer to come back from, particularly during the winter time and in the home. Inside in a pot, they just don't grow as fast. As far as light's concerned, typically I have always seen the best growth out of these when they're getting really nice, bright, almost direct sun during the morning time and then shade in the afternoon or at least filtered dappled light with a tree or something above it in the afternoon. They are usually regarded as a shade plant, but I've just, I've noticed much better growth out of them when they're getting more light. But there is also a downside to that. The more light they get, chances are the smaller the leaves are going to be. And they, perhaps that's even why these dulled out. You can see the older foliage on this big one, they dulled out. Usually the foliage has a nice glossy sheen to it. I thought maybe it was spider mites, but I mean, it's been months, haven't seen any. I think it's because these were sitting in a spot all winter outside underneath a deciduous tree. It can be a mistake sometimes, right? Gotta remember when a deciduous tree loses its leaves and the shade plants underneath it, if they're evergreen, they might fry. And these didn't fry, but they did lose some of their sheen. And that's okay. You can see the new growth coming out the top. It looks lovely. When the new growth emerges from these plants, it looks so fun. It's fuzzy and dainty, and I know that that looks like it's thirsty, but that's what they do. They come out kind of upside down and cupped, and then they'll unfurl and open up. That's what it's supposed to look like. It's not like it's wilty and sad. It's just doing what it does. So yes, they will do well in a shady spot of the garden, but it's beneficial to make sure that they get some filtered light on them, and they can typically take more light than I feel a lot of people say that they can. That's just my opinion because I've pushed them pretty far and I don't think I've ever had any issues with leaf scorch on them and they've gotten a lot of light before. Or variegation they have on them if you're growing one of the spider webs or even the camouflage or the regular <laughs> variegated one and there are a few others. I have some cool ones come in the mail here in a few weeks. Then those are probably, you want to go less light with those because they're going to be more susceptible to burning. But just the regular one, I go part shade to part sun with it outdoors. I like a potting mixture for these that drains very quickly but has a lot of good organic stuff in it. So earthworm castings, maybe be some uh, kelp, compost, those sorts of things. It's just important to remember that the more organics that are in a potting mix, the more you need to watch that soil for clumping over time because it'll break down and kind of turn into a mud. So you don't want their soil to hold on to moisture for too terribly long. It needs to drain really, really well. And they do enjoy being watered, particularly when they're outside. In the house, growing them is very different than outside. Outside, I make sure that these get watered pretty much every single day. It depends on how hot it is. The warmer it is, the more light they're getting, the more water they're going to need. But I typically grub just like I would pretty much any of my tropicals or temperate tropicals when they're outside during the summertime, making sure that they don't really dry out like basically at all. But the top few inches can dry, but I don't let them go much further than that. Not when it's over like 85 or 90 degrees outside, then that's when I really want to make sure that they're staying well hydrated. Okay, but indoors. A lot of people are growing these as house plants. And the main thing that I hear about them when people are struggling with them is that they'll just kind of weather and die and rot away. And that's usually caused from too much water. And also because they're regarded as a shade plant, then uh, sometimes people may think, well, when this is inside, it can take really low light. And while that is true, it's just important to remember that the less light the plant gets, the less water it's going to need. They're gonna be much more susceptible to being overwatered if you have these in a room where they're not getting very much light. Indoors, there are two different ways that I grow these. If I have them actually in the house where it's around 70-ish degrees, maybe 40% humidity, then I make sure that they get watered roughly every seven to 10 days. I'll let the soil dry out to 50%, sometimes even all the way. They don't seem to mind it when it's not warm and there's not a breeze on them drying them out. And they are a plant that'll let you know when they need to be watered as well. Leaves will start to sag and hang down and look sad. That's an indication that the plant needs some water, which is also, I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because that can also be a characteristic of a plant that's being overwatered. But when they're being overwatered, you'll start to see more yellowing on the foliage. If they're just kind of hanging down a little bit and you feel the soil or feel the weight of the pot and you can tell that it needs water, just give it a little drink and those should pop right back up. 
And that can be a good way to gauge and see how often you'll need to water them for yourself in your climate, wherever you have them in your house. It's because they can take different conditions that it does make this a more difficult plant to talk about when it comes to house plant care. But in a nutshell, when it comes to growing them inside, I typically like to go by that rule of the more light, the more warmth, the more water, the less light, the less warmth, the less water. Does that make sense? Hopefully. It's one of those things where you just kind of have to play around with it and experiment because all of our climates are different and our elevations. And there are a lot of factors that can go into how often you'll need to water it. But if you're below 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the home, then they can dry out usually for a while before you need to worry about watering them. So that's one way to grow them inside, just as your typical house plant. The way I grow these now is that I have had at least these two for several years. Since I know that they can take a good amount of cold, these are outside for me. Typically, like I would say nine to 10 months out of the year. This year they were outside for like 11 and a half months because we had a really mild winter except for like a two and a half week period in February that just like annihilated everything. Other than that, these were outside, these two were outside potted and sitting on the patio all winter long and they were okay. That wasn't really typical for here in zone 60. That's not usually how it goes. Normally what I do with these is if temperatures are gonna be dropping below 15, then I make sure that they go into the, my garage and I put them in a low light spot and I just let them chill. So they're going to stay usually between 45 and I'd say 70 degrees because the, the garage is heated partially because that's where I keep most of my tropical plants. But I don't put these in the area with the tropical plants. They sit outside of like the plastic area that's heated. It just stays nice and cool and they just chill. They just hang out and stay dormant. I don't really have to do much with them. Kind of similar to what you would do with a plumeria, except that I make sure they get watered more often than I would a dormant plumeria. They, I will splash them with water probably like once a month, if even, as long as it's cool and they aren't getting a ton of light then I just let them hang out. They do their thing, they're fine. I've always thought one of the marks of an excellent houseplant is versatility. The Fatsias really are versatile plants. We know this because you can grow them a fair amount of different ways. They really like those really rainy conditions, misty conditions you get up in like the Pacific Northwest, but you can also grow them in more warm Southern climates. Main difference is how you're going to grow the plant in those conditions. And then that same thing applies indoors, right? Like I've been mentioning, less light, less water, more light, more water, and so on. And there aren't a ton of plants that have the nice big tropical looking type of foliage that you can keep in a cooler part of the home. If you have like say a, maybe a sunroom or something that isn't heated, but the temperature is okay during the winter time, say in like the 30s, 40s, even 20s, these would do excellent in a space like that. Or maybe you have like a really cool basement that doesn't stay as warm, it's nice and humid though. Good option. A lot of tropical plants, a lot of house plants are tropical plants and they don't like those conditions. They're going to want warmth. So while they can take it, they don't have to have it. It's really just about how you're going to grow them with your varying conditions. I will say this is a video that I have been a little bit more apprehensive to make only because I know that with these being regarded as shade plants that as far as houseplant care goes, I would imagine the majority of any other videos that are out there are probably saying to grow them in low light. And I think I've been hinting it that I, I don't really agree with that indoors. Outdoors, shade to part shade, totally fine. And while they can take low light conditions inside, they're just gonna be so much more susceptible to rot and you're not going to get as much growth out of them. Shade outdoors is not the same as shade indoors. Shade outdoors, I would say is more equivalent to uh, probably what would be part sun inside because the way the light comes through the house and everything it's just different so when i have them in the house not in my garage but in the house i do prefer that they get a few hours of bright light during the day it doesn't have to be directly on them it's probably better that it isn't in fact unless you have them a few feet back from a window but it's just when i balance out like the logic behind how to grow them inside since sometimes people have to experiment and get to know their plants and their climate it's so much easier to bring a plant back from having some scorched leaves because you gave it too much light inside than to bring the plant back from having it starting to rot because it wasn't getting enough light and stayed moist for too long because that water is just going to sit around that root ball if the plant isn't actively growing and the plant's not going to actively grow if it's not getting enough light. So to me, it just seems like it's safer to push it a little bit further in the bright direction than in the dark direction, even though they are shade plants for outdoors and they will do fine in a, I'm not gonna say a dark room in the house, but you can grow them as a low light house plant. I know I said that multiple times. It is an option. Some people pull it off for years, no problem. 
It's just something you kind of have to play around with and get to know the plant in your house and their variables with your soil and all kinds of factors that go into that. But for me, nice bright light during the morning time and afternoon shade has always been great for them. I mean, they got a bit too much outside during the winter time, but none of the leaves scorch. So that does go to show you that if it's cooler out, then at least in my climate, they can take more sun than I even thought they could. That could have been a lot worse. They're dull, but they didn't burn. I fertilize them like I would my typical house plants or many of my perennials that I have outside. I can use a liquid, just an all purpose is fine with them. I prefer to just keep the soil well amended. So I'll add in compost, worm casting, those things like I talked about. And I found that when I do that, the plants don't need to be fertilized anywhere near as often. During the winter time, they don't get fertilized at all. I don't even mess with that. If I had them inside, say I had a sunroom or a warm room, just any spot where they're going to stay growing with some kind of vigor, then I would probably continue to fertilize, maybe monthly, just like once a month. But when they're just chilling and hanging out for the winter time, there's no reason to. It doesn't make sense, right? As far as pests are concerned, I haven't really noticed any particular pests to favor them over another. I have heard from other people that spider mites love them. I, I had some spider mite issues this winter and they stayed away from my others, but they were only in the growth space for like two and a half weeks. So it's probably not a fair gauge. I have seen mealybugs on them before, but they didn't seem to favor this plant over others. So like from my experience, it just seems to be typical houseplant pest issues. Nothing that's going to be more severe. Like if I were going like a cordelin for the cussa, mealybugs love those. They flock to them. I haven't noticed that with any of these. That's never been an issue. Never been target plants for a particular pest in my experience, but I have heard from others. Comment down below if you've had issues with a particular type of pest with these plants. Let us know. And I should have mentioned when I was talking about the fertilizer, if you have these in the ground, I mean, maybe if you have them potted, but uh, the holly tone or a fertilizer that's made for woody acid loving plants, they would probably appreciate something more like that. They do tend to prefer their soil more on the acidic side, acidic to neutral. But again, they're pretty sturdy, versatile plants. I just prune as needed. They hold onto their leaves for a really long time. They don't let just drop them like crazy and spit out new ones because of that more moderate growth rate, particularly like I said, if they're in a pot or in the house. They don't need to be pruned very often, but if you have unsightly foliage, just cut it off. Typically, if you have a leaf that you don't like, usually you can come in and they should just snap right off. It would probably be better to use snippers, clippers, something that's gonna make a nice clean cut, but usually they pull off nice and clean. Just wanna be careful if it's tender new growth that you're not pulling very hard on it because that will rip all that new growth off of the plant. If you've been around this channel for a while, there's that sun, love those shadows. Then you may remember last time I talked about this one, this variegated one. I don't remember if it's a variegated or a spider's web. The spider's web, that's this one over here. Remember that one, this little guy right there? They sometimes won't show their typical variegation until they get to be a little bit larger. I was surprised to see that this is starting to show this variegation at the smaller size. Spider's web being one where the variegation is much more kind of like mottled and speckly inside of the leaves. It will get even more intense than this. Over time, it'll start to look like the leaf is frosted almost, and it looks really cool. Whereas just the regular variegated, which is what I thought this one was, but I actually think this one might be a spider's web and just wasn't labeled properly. Anyways, last summer, I talked about how it had reverted. Which you can see right here, it's all green. But it also started putting out nice variegated foliage. And the variegation on it is more of what you would see on a spider's web too. You can see, maybe you can see how it has more of a frosted appearance, where it's just a regular variegated fatsia that's going to be like chunky white splotches, as opposed to that even spread of white speckles. Like I was saying though, what I had talked about last summer was mostly just debating, should I cut it back? since it had reverted. And then I decided, you know, I'm just going to leave it because it had new growth coming out the bottom down here and that was coming out with variegation on it. So I figured if I let that grow until it's about, I'd say four to five inches high, then I can pluck that off and propagate it. These will propagate from stem cuttings. Generally, I like to make sure that there's at least five inches of stem. I'll remove the majority of the leaves, leaving maybe two or three leaves on whatever piece that I pluck off the plant put them into like a sphagum moss blend, something that's gonna stay nice and moist. A rooting hormone's probably a good idea, and it usually takes them a couple months, but they'll get rooted. Another way you can do it if you wanna be a cheater, and sometimes I'll do this, if I have a piece, which I'm not sure, these are mostly offshoots on here, but if I have a piece that's branching out from the side of the trunk on the plant, 
but down low, then I'll just take a ball of wet sphagnum moss and stick it under there. Make sure it's in contact with that chunk of the plant and usually it will root into that and can cut it off a few months later. So I never cut any of that foliage out and it turned out to be okay. It started spitting out variegated leaves again, like you can see here. And it looks like the new growth is probably going to come out with some variegation on it, but I would say that's, that's still pretty small to say for sure. Well, I do think that the variegation on the spider's web and the regular variegated variety is absolutely beautiful. I also, I really like and appreciate just the plain green form of the plant. So I was sort of indifferent to what happened with those variegated leaves. That's why I was like, I'll just leave it and see what happens. And since I now know that I have two spider webs, I thought that I, this was a variegated and that one was, because this is labeled just variegated. See right there, it just says variegated fatsia fatsia variegated. And it wasn't until just a couple of days ago that I actually took the tag out and looked at it. And it says clearly right there, spider's web. Yes, I mean, the spider's web is a variegated fatsia, so that's not wrong but I, I wouldn't have gotten it since I already have one over here. But this one looks different. It has bigger growth on it, so it's not the end of the world. But I placed a plant order and got some more fatsias because I really enjoy growing these since I can have them outside for such, like, basically 75 to 90% of the year. These can be outdoors. And I want more plants that have that temperate type of quality to them things that I don't have to panic to take inside if we have a cold snap in October. So I ordered a few more varieties and I ordered a spider's web because I just wasn't thinking straight and was like, oh, well, I have a variegated one and then I got another variegated one. And I didn't put it together. So now I'm gonna have three spider's webs. There's another one coming in the mail. And then the other one, I can't remember the name of it. I'll put it up here on the screen. It has really cool looking foliage on it. I don't know if I could even pronounce that name if I tried, if I could remember it, but it's it's a neat looking one. I have heard reports that sometimes the variegated, I don't know about the spider's web, but just the regular Fatsia japonica that's variegated, that that one can be more cold hardy. I've seen some people talk about that online and I believe when I did this plant haul, somebody left a comment in the video about seeing one in like zone 7a somewhere in Tennessee maybe with a variegated one that had been growing wonderfully. Well that might be something to consider if you're looking to keep one of these outside. Maybe get one of the variegated ones if they're going to be more hardy. I mean why not? The variegated foliage is beautiful on them. I mean really beautiful right? That is some gorgeous foliage. If only it wasn't buried and hidden underneath all these green leaves. I could go ahead and cut these out. I just don't see a reason to since the plant's growing well. It's nice and healthy, new growth is coming out, so it's fine, it can stay. Especially since now I know that I'm about to have three of them. This is, it doesn't even matter, right? More the merrier, more variety. As far as troubleshooting is concerned, sometimes when you have rot with these, what you'll see along the stem, make sure, gotta make sure everybody can see what I'm talking about here. Hopefully that's visible, can we see that? This right here was the original growth of the plant. And then uh, it, I don't really remember what happened, but something killed off the main growing apex here, right at the top. And when that happens, it's not the end of the world. It's best to go ahead and cut that off. I think I just left it because I was waiting to see if it was fully dead and then forgot about it. But they will put off offshoots out the side and start to grow and branch from there. I mean, branch from there. They typically will have more of a monopodial growth to them than something that's gonna have complex branches. But they will branch in the sense that each growth can put out offshoots but it's not like something you'd see on like when you think of a tree right so if you start to notice that that growing tip that's in there that apex is shriveling and stuff isn't growing out of it you can start cutting down along there until things look more green and healthy but i wouldn't start doing those cuttings unless that center is kind of black and squishy or if the leaves pull out that's when i make sure to go ahead and keep making cuts down that stem until there's no more squish and it's nice and firm and then it will typically start to branch out from the set i mean you just saw it. we already talked about it yeah you get it i also don't have a rule for when i repot them i'm trying to think of like what the questions and comments might be in my head and answer those uh i know with house plants it's not unusual for us to say oh every year every other year I just repot as needed. They, they don't follow a rule. It's when I notice that I'm watering the plant, that's not responding to being watered. That's when I repot the plant. If I notice there's roots coming out the tops and the bottom, it's time to repot the plant. I did mention, I believe in the beginning of the video that usually with these plants, the larger the pot, the larger the leaves, similar to like a philodendron bipinatifidum, now thematophyllum bipinatifidum, but those are another plant where the bigger the pot, typically the bigger the leaves. Just repotted this one here last year, the bigger one in the middle. I'm going to repot it again this year. Right now, I believe that that's in a 10 inch container. I'm probably going to bump it up fairly considerably into a 14 inch container. 
which I wouldn't do if I were growing this indoors because it's not, it's more likely to have too much water around that new root ball and it could rot the plant. Outside, there's enough airflow. It's going to be nice and warm for it. It'll root out into a pot that's sizably larger without any issues. So I'm not worried about that. This little one down here, that spider's web, this one is in a six inch pot right now. And I will probably, I may even bump it right up into a 12 inch and just let it spend the summer rooting itself out into that container and it should be good by fall. I don't think there'll be a problem with that. But again, if I were indoors, then probably follow that typical rule of an inch to two inches on the outside diameter of the pot for repotting. Usually with plants that go in the house, I like to talk about whether or not they're toxic, uh, just to at least mention it. This is one of those plants where most websites say it's non-toxic, but I found a few that say it's toxic. I love when the information's all over the place with something that's that important. However, I always say the same thing with every video. It's best practice to just keep plants away from curious mouths, regardless of whether it's edible or not, just to be safe, right? Unless it's something you're growing for the animal, then it, why even risk having a spot where they could chew on it? But I get it. It's nice to have that reassurance of knowing that if you do, if you have a cat that's munching on the plant, that's going to be okay. And since I would feel absolutely awful if I told people something was non-toxic and then their pet died or a child got sick, I'm not gonna say it's safe just because there are a couple websites that contradict really popular websites that I trust, which say that it's safe. But unless it's like 100% across the board, I don't feel comfortable with that. So do you get what I'm saying there? Sorry, I can't, I don't wanna give a concrete answer on something that doesn't have concrete results. The majority of things I see say that it's okay though. But ASPCA's website does list Fatsia japonica as non-toxic to dogs, cats, and horses. So I think it should be fine, right? There's always those outliers. The more the internet grows, the more complicated it gets to just be like, yes, no, and give solid answers. I know this was a long video. It was supposed to be a discussion. It was intended to be a long video because like I said, it's a plant where there really is a lot to say about them. I could have just made a basic plant care video and said, keep it in low light, don't water it very often, don't fertilize during the winter time and repot every couple of years. But I like to go more in depth than that, which if, you, if you've been around this channel, I think y'all are aware of that. Comment down below, you guys been growing these, what's your experiences with them, cold hardiness, what do you like to do with them in the house? Have you also noticed that they do tend to maybe look a little bit better and you get more solid growth out of them when they get a little bit more light in the house than as opposed to being in more dark conditions. Like I said, you can not grow them in a poorly lit room, in a darker room. You can do that. It's just, it's just going to sit there though. You're not going to get much out of the plant. And if you're okay with that, that's fine. Just don't water it too much because it will rot and die on you. Oh, and there are some hybrids with the Fatsia japonica as well. There's the Fat Shidera. And well, I guess that's really the only one that comes to mind as far as hybrids grow, go hybrids go. Those are a cross between the Fatsia japonica and those tree ivies and they look pretty cool. The leaves are more narrow on them, still quite large though. I don't think they grow quite as tall. You know, these will get like maybe six feet indoors, well, much larger than that outside and grow faster outside as well. I believe that those ivy hybrids, I think they stay maybe between four and six feet. I could be wrong though. I haven't even looked into them because I like these as they are. I'm not really that interested in the hybrid, but it's an option out there. If that's something someone's interested in. It might be fun to look up the Fat Shaderas. These have some fun relatives. I didn't mention the common names on these, which I should have done in the beginning of the video. The Fatsia japonica or Japanese Aurelia, Japanese false Aurelia. Also the paper plant, rice paper plant. When I hear paper plant and rice paper plant, I tend to think of Tetrapanix papaphyra, which used to, I believe, be a uh, Fatsia papaphyra, and they moved it over to Tetrapanix. I think it's the only plant within its species at this point. But they have a similar look to this, but it's like if you were to cross this with like a castor bean, and they're more cold hardy. They, have, they grow more quickly. They're much more cold hardy than these are. And if you're looking for something really fun and big, bold foliage to put outside, that would be a great option if you can find a Tetrapanix. They, their care is different though. So I probably shouldn't have brought that one up, but it might be something fun to look into. If you're into these, you might like those as well. All right, time to go. Hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life and everything's just going beautifully for you. Like I mentioned, don't forget to comment down below. It's impossible to cover everything, even when the video's like absolutely absurdly long for talking about a plant that's pretty easy to grow. Because I want to talk about growing them inside and outside and I want to talk about the cold hardiness, makes the videos really long. I would apologize for the length of the videos, but most people seem to enjoy that. And why would you click on a video that's really long if you don't want to watch a long video, right? 
no big deal. Sometime in the next few weeks, God, these shadows are awful. Like I said, I have a few more coming sometime in the next few weeks. I do want to expand my Fatsia collection, not necessarily growing all the different varieties, but just having more of them. Because like I said, I really like the idea of being able to have a whole bunch of these to keep outside when everything else has to go in. And like I have my Akuba Japonicas, those the Mr. Gold Strike, I believe that's mostly what I have. They stay out most of the year and they have that really nice bold foliage on them that just makes the garden stand out more in wintertime. And these do the same thing until it gets down to, like I said, 15 degrees. And then I take them in because I don't want to kill them. Like that poor camouflage. It didn't, I, I don't know why it died. It was pot planted. It was sitting in the same spot as these two, but it did not fare as well. But like I said, maybe the soil it was in was more moisture retentive potentially. So maybe it got too wet and just stayed that way. Or maybe it didn't like the sun because he's got a lot of sun during the winter time without having the leaves on the tree above him. So that could have been it. Or maybe it's just less cold hardy or any of those like combination of things. I don't really know. But it is what it is. Learn something from it. So it's not the end of the world. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on grow. Oh, wow. That is really pretty. Keep on growing. Bye bye.